And I remember I was a gunner on, on, on a vehicle. I remember hearing like a bunch of ricochets. And I was like, again, first time. So I'm, I kind of like, you know, kneeled down a little bit. I'm like, hey, Ma, I think we're getting shot at. Uh, so my name is Chris Cleland. Uh, I served in the U.S. Army Infantry. Uh, I served from 2004 to 2008. And I got out as a sergeant, an E5. So I'm uh, originally from El Monte, California. Um, upbringing was... You know, kind of like I guess everyone else's upbringing when it comes to, uh, uh, I guess, California in general. You know, uh, parents split when I was probably, I don't know, a couple years old or whatnot. Uh, my dad, um, you know, did, did his time, uh, you know, in and out of, out of, uh, uh, of uh, jail for quite some time. Um, he actually was a Marine as well. Uh, me, well a Marine. He, he did, a, a, I believe he did like three, four years in, in the Marines, some, somewhere around there. Um, but... Upbringing was just kind of basic, you know, um, lived, lived in Omani my entire life. So I joined the service. Uh, my mom was kind of a, a the stay, not to stay home. She was, she was the, a, the single mother working, right? She was supporting me and my two brothers. Um, luckily, you know, uh, my stepdad, uh, which I, I refer to him now, you know, as my father, he raised me since I was, since I was about five years old, been still there, you know, has been there for 34 years. Um, he came along, you know, and it's kind of like, uh, never missed a beat to be honest. Uh, never, never missed out, I guess, on any kind of childhood opportunities because he was always there to support, you know, and, and do what he did. So, you know, extremely grateful, you know, I didn't have to miss out on anything growing up. You know, it was just, uh, yeah, very fortunate to, to have him come in. I hung around with my, my brother's friends. My brother's kind of a, one of those uh, out there kind of people, you know, does, does, I don't think he's learned a lesson even yet. You know, he's 40 years old and kind of runs around and does some, some dumb things, but um, kind of my, my idol growing up a little bit. <laughs> You know, he was that dude that no one would mess with him. Like, like literally somebody would come to him and he'd like, you know, he'd be that guy who would, would stand his ground, beat you down. And, you know, he was that guy. So I ran around with him, his buddies and stuff, and just got me in trouble, you know. Ended up uh, actually getting arrested for a couple of GTAs when I was younger. Yeah, running around with them, just, uh, um, yeah, it was, it was crazy. Getting, getting arrested in front of my mom in our driveway, you know, in front of my, my godson, you know, on the ground getting cuffed. It was just a... Kind of a, a rude awakening for me, you know, seeing, seeing that my mom was going through so much stuff, you know, with, with you know, her two, her two youngest, you know, uh, kind of changed my perspective on what, what I need to be doing and who I should be and, you know, just kind of flipped script and decided to join the military and just change it up. When I got in, it was 2004, right? So this is the time when, when we needed so many people to be in the military, you know, we're deploying, um, you know, it was just, a, it was just a, a thing where everyone was just joining, right? So... There wasn't any like hard push. You know, the recruiters were making their quota no matter what. They were like hitting every number. But um, at the same time, uh, my recruiter was like, you know, you could do whatever you want, go wherever you want, and whatnot. You know, um, in my head, all I wanted to do was be in the infantry. I always knew that I wanted to be an infantryman. You know, like I said, my dad was, my grandfather was. Um, just a thing that you know, I just figured, you know, it's just the uh, the only the only the only branch you know that I would go to was the army, but. You know, I had to also do do the infantry because it's just kind of a family thing that everyone did. But recruiter definitely did me dirty for sure. You know, he <laughs> promised me the world, and then, you know, I, I got you know Georgia. <laughs> what types of things did he promise you? Oh man, um, you know, a big thing that I wanted to do is I wanted I wanted to be uh, airborne in Italy. You know, that was like my goal. Uh, he was like, no problem. Be the top of your PT. Um, you know. Just, just do everything that, you know, when you go to basic, basic, right? You know, just, just handle your business. So I'm like, cool. Went out there, handled my business, but you know, didn't happen that way. Uh -huh. <laughs> Whew. Basic training. Um, it was definitely a shocker for sure. He said, I'm, I've been that dude that's always been like outgoing. I've been that clown, like literally from, I don't even know, probably birth. I got videos of me like I, when I was like five years old, just, you know, acting like Jim Carrey, just doing like, you know, voices faces and like talking out of my butt and that kind of stuff and i'm telling like i'm literally doing stuff and i just kind of carry that on i carry that same personality on into, into the army and um i think i think we both gave each other a little a little rude awakening you know they they gave me a rude awakening with with their structure and i gave them a rude awakening where you know you can only hurt, hurt me so so much you know as far as like physical fatigue but i'm still going to be that same dude out there like kind of like pushing the limit i had this drill sergeant drill sergeant jowers and he was very, very fully aware of, of me and how I acted, right? And like my behaviors, I guess you could say. So 
when we go to the shower hall line, what he used to do is he, he'd, you know, say, you know, Private Cleveland, you know, I go, I'm running up all fucking happy and excited, right? I'm like, yes, Joe Sarn. He's like, laugh for me. I'm like, negative, Joe Sarn. I'm not, I'm not going to laugh. He's like, laugh for me. I'm like, negative, Joe Sarn. I'm not going to laugh. He's like, okay. You know, we're all going to wait here until, until you're ready. When you, when you want to laugh, you know, everyone else is going to eat. I'm like, ha ha. He's like, get the fuck down. You fucking never laugh in my chow hall line. And, you know, going crazy, right? I'm down. Fuck. He's like, everybody join him. So everyone's getting smoked. You know, and this is like a, this is a pretty uh, often, you know, uh, pretty often occasion type thing. You know, like we're, we're literally doing this almost every meal, like for a while, just to kind of like show me like, hey, you want to be a fool? They're all going to pay for it. But in the end, I told them all, you know, because they're all like, damn, Cleveland, like, stop, whatever. And I was like, what's, like, what's, what's, what's the, what's the harm? You know, we're all going to get stronger. We're, we're, you know, we're going to have a good time doing it, you know? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, a couple of them didn't like it, but, you know, yeah, it is what it is. <laughs> so what job did you sign up for? I signed up for the infantry, 11 Bravo. Um, when, they, when I went into, went into, into the map station or whatever and, you know, was signing up, you know, they gave me a list of jobs I can do. And the only job that I wanted to do was infantry. So they were like, hey, you know, we have all these other things to do. I was like, I'm good, you know. And they gave me what I thought was, you know, so much money. They're like, we'll give you $2,500 for, for, for four years, you know. Because it was three years or four years. And at that time, I was like, $2,500? Oh, damn. Like, for real? Like, you'll, you'll give me that? And they were like, yeah. I'm like, all right, cool. Let me go and do, do four years. So I signed up for that extra year, you know, got my little $2,500. that I, I didn't realize it'd get taxed. And then they'll give it to you over like time and all that kind of fun stuff. So, man, they they got me. So, my whole base training was structured all together, right? So I had like um, base training. Then I had uh, I also had uh, my combat infantryman's you know advanced course as well, right? So we just went through the whole thing. So from February of 2004 to May of 2004, uh, I was just there at Fort Stewart, Georgia. You know, just doing that that total train. You know, the, their what they call their intense training. Um, from there. I literally went down the street. <laughs> I went to Fort Stewart, Georgia, you know, uh, 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, it was different. It's different, you know, from, from being, from being in, base, in basic training where, um, you know, you really have no, no say so on what to do and whatnot and you got there, you just get that little, that little sense of freedom, right? You get that little piece where you're like, you know, I'm not going to be told what to do every second of my day, you know, but... Um, Things change slowly, and when you get there, you get your unit. Things, things definitely go back to uh, you do what I say when I say. So, I know my experience is probably 100% different than anybody else's, only because they wanted to experiment with with who, with us coming in, and we were going to be the first light infantry attached to a mechanized unit, right? So we were with the Second Brigade, Third Infantry Division, uh, 164 Armor Battalion. Um, so we were actually there's probably like, I don't even know, six of us for the, in, in the company at the time. We didn't do anything at all. Wow. We, had, we had a dude that was there that was our, our uh, you know, the E5 is in charge of us. You know, he was the acting first sergeant as an E5 because we had nobody, you know. And I mean, I, again, I was an E2 at the time. I was like an acting squad leader. Like, I, I mean, it was, it was just crazy. Like, we were literally just like, a new guy would come in and we're, and we're running it. We're like, come here, Joe. <laughs> you know, let me talk to you real quick. Um, but yeah, it was different. Like you know, it was that, like that for a while until they decided to build the build our little thing up. And then once it was built, that's when it got real. Mm. That's when that's when all the uh, the um, the combat you know uh, infantrymen came in. That's when the higher NCOs came. We had the E fives, the sixes. We got to put tunes on, you know, or E seven Ranger tabs and whatnot. And I'm just like some bad dudes. And we had our one of our a guy that was there that had a sniper tab. You know, I'm just like these are some some people. You know, like these these dudes are some some some, some real dudes. Every day was uh, uh, some crazy stuff. Like I've, you know, I'm 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 full full Hispanic, right? I'm, I'm Mexican, but I don't speak any Spanish whatsoever. You know, and it's kind of like my uh, my thing that I you know I I wish I wish I could have type of thing, right? Um, but when I was there, literally the first NCO that came to me, he was like Cleveland. Like what what kind of a what kind of a Mexican name is Cleveland? I'm like, I don't know. I, you know, you know, somebody from Scotland came over to Mexico and, you know, they had, you know, had babies and whatnot. He was like, you got to be the worst spick that I've ever heard in my life. I'm like, well, what's a spick? 
you know, <laughs> I never even heard of that before, you know? So things changed, yeah. you know, I, I got my, my first taste of a, of a, um, how we speak to each other, like the, like the real speak to each other, right? Cause I mean, obviously when you speak like that in civilian life, you know, you get, you get butt hurt, you, you know, you call it in or whatever you do, you know, for work. But, um, you know, in the, in the military, especially the infantry, I mean, it's probably the most, the most family orientated group of people, but at the same time, you can be the most racist, brutal fucking people to each other. And, and it just feels like home. It's weird. I could talk to my buddies today and like the same people and be dumb as hell and say some racist shit to each other. And like, we laugh and laugh and like, we think it's the funniest thing, like crying, laughing. And it's just, yeah, it's like that, that bond for that unit that we had that people can't do. I got to my unit in June. I had six months to get ready to, to deploy my first time, right? 19 years old, um, you know, I turned 20 there, you know, on my field, field prop, which they, you know, rewarded me with, uh, you know, making me throw up all my, all my child, whatever, you know, for my birthday, which was amazing. One of the NCOs was like messing with me. He was like, hey, he's like, it's your birthday. I'm all, yeah. He's all, he's all, why don't you go ahead and go get seconds, you know? And I'm just like, you know, all starving. We're out on the field prop. I'm like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go, appreciate it. I go in there, I start getting my plate and then, you know, I'm eating. And then one of the, uh, one of the other platoons was coming in right behind me. They're like, Cleveland, didn't you already eat? And I was like, yeah, Roger, but I'm all, so-and-so says he's always, so, no, 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 no. Did you already eat? I'm like, yeah. He was like, meet me outside, put the plate down. I'm like, okay. I go outside, I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I'm like, okay, like whatever. This is my, my, you know, one of my first, I'm sorry, it's probably like my third field problem. Um, and yeah, he's like waits for me out there. He's like, okay, so what do we do about this? I'm like, about what? He's like, what are we gonna do about you stealing chow? I'm like, I'm not stealing chow. Like they literally told me to, you know, to get another one. He's like, oh, it's my birthday today. He's like, oh, it's your birthday. You know, like, you know, with the fakest, the fakest smile and the, you know, the excitement was was just so dull. I was like, all right, what are we gonna do now? He was just like. Let me, let's, let's do this. He's like, how far do you think it is from here like to over there? It's probably a good like 50 yards or so, right? And we're, you know, we're in, we're in Georgia. So everything's like pine things everywhere. And, you know, it's just the worst crappy terrain on, on, on the crappiest grass in the world. So he's like, this is what I want you to do. Go and get your weapon. He's like, I want to see you low crawl, but we're not going to do like regular low crawl. I want you to inch your way, right? I want you to continue to inch your way, you know, on, down. And they don't stop until you get over there. I'm like, all right, start with those. They were doing flutter kicks. They were doing everything. They were literally doing everything they could pull out of his, you know, repertoire of like punishment until I threw up all that food. And I was like, you know, happy birthday to me, you know, <laughs> 19 years old in, in the U.S. Army Infantry. So we, we went to, to Baghdad. Our, our fob was a fob Rastamaya, right? So we're like in Mosul, Providence, you know, um, that was our, our initial spot. We, we, actually, we actually flew into Kuwait first initially. And then because we were going to be light infantry, they decided it's not going to work, you know, because whatever happened with the unit and whatever, whatever they decided to change it up. So we ended up being motorized, right? So we're in um, 114, you know, we're, we're in the Humvees. Um, so we actually drove in from Kuwait, like a, I don't even remember how many days it was, but we, we, drew, we drove all those, you know, from Kuwait all the way through into Baghdad. Um, I remember actually going into Baghdad and it was kind of a, it was a culture shock, you know, because um, I, I knew kind of like an idea of like what it would look like. But like driving in, you know, like people were everywhere, you know, and we we're told, you know, be vigilant, obviously. Right. You want to see who's who, know who's who and, and kind of like scope out the scene. But there were so many people walking around, like all around the Humvee in between us and everything. It was like, who's who, you know, who's who's bad, who's good. And in my head, I remember thinking it's going to be a hard time. You know, trying to trying to de decipher who's who. You know, when we just got into into our, our fob, there was like no actual, I guess, um, set path of what we're going to be doing. Right? We we knew we we're going to be motorized. We know we're in infantry. We know we're going to be clearing buildings. You know, we we knew that part of it all, but we didn't know the extent of like our missions on what we're, what we're going to be doing out there. I think that was kind of a a thing where we're kind of pumped and kind of not pumped. Right? We're like, cool. We know we're going to go in houses. We know we're going to clear buildings. We know we're going to go through. You know. But we didn't know exactly what that entailed. Um, we found out later on you, that my uh, platoon was actually going to get branched out to uh, Charlie Company, which is a tank company. So we're the infantry side with the tanks. So basically, we go in with the Humvees. They do outside, you know, uh, cordons, right? Make sure no vehicles came into our stuff. So whenever we cleared 
um, houses or buildings or whatnot, we'd have them as our outside perimeters. Initially, you know, um, it was kind of quiet learning the routes, you know, seeing where to go. And I remember, uh, but I remember our, our first firefight, um, it was different. You know, it was, uh, man, those, those emotions were different for sure. Those emotions were, were a mixture of like, um, you know, kind of freaked out, not knowing what to do, confused, you know, it was just everything. Uh, we're, we're on this route and I remember it was being like the, it was dark as hell, right? It was nighttime driving down the probably maybe had like an inch on each side of our, our wheels, right? The Humvee, the base of it. And we're just driving down this, this, this road. And I remember I was the gunner on, on, on the vehicle. And I remember hearing like a bunch of ricochets and I was like, again, first time. So I'm, I kind of like, you know, kneeled down a little bit. I'm like, Hey, Ma, I think we're getting shot at, you know, like all like, and my sergeant's like, Return fire. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. That's what we do. Literally turn my turret, you know, I have a, a, a 240 Bravo, right, machine gun. I'm just unloading, you know, just like, just firing into the, into the direction where I've seen these rounds come from. Um, then all of a sudden we're getting rounds from the other side, you know, switching my turret back to the other side, firing into this area, and then, you know, we heard no more. So um, we never went down to investigate, you know, what was what, we just kind of hauled out and just, just bailed, but man, those emotions were like something different. Like I've never felt in my life. Like, uh, um, like the, the fear of like, you know, of, of everything kind of, you know, dissipated, it was gone. You know, I didn't even, didn't get that no more. It was more of like just instinct on like, you know, it was like three o'clock, four o'clock, you know, and tell me where to go. And I'm just like, just unloading. It was, it was intense. It kind of had a mixture of jobs out there. Um, I was also an M249, you know, saw gunner. So I had like the, the squad machine gun. Um, I would, uh, sometimes just, you know, jump off, you know, with, with everyone clearing, clearing buildings, going around, um, doing, doing, um, I guess it's, what do you call it? Like, uh, showing presence, right? That was our whole goal to show them that we're still there, you know, so they, they don't start pushing back into where we're at. Um, it was a, we had a, a heavy, <clears throat> heavy, uh, um, issue with artillery, right? They were like bombing our, our, our fob a lot, you know, we're literally getting incoming, incoming bombings all the damn time. So as you, um, you know, as you go around, walk around the fob, there's these big old like cement barrier things, right? Where you're supposed to get under, which to me is like, I don't know, kind of, kind of a thing that just wouldn't do anything at all. I think it's just it's more, more of a mental thing, right? Like, Hey, get under this thing. You know, like when you're in school or like earthquake, get under your table, get on the table. Right. I mean, something that falls on things to break or whatever. But um, the procedure, procedure was to get to that, you know, as soon as you, you know, when you hear the noise, the sirens go off to let you know. Obviously, more often than none, the siren goes off after the bombs already, you know, hit, right? So where the bomb drops, you know, we hear it, we go run off to our little spots, whatever, and we stay there till, you know, until it's done. I mean, but again, it's usually something that happens after. What you hear first is initial boom, and you don't know if it's an IED outside or if it's, you know, something coming in. So you hear it and you kind of like second guess, like, you know, was that a V-bed, you know, or what was that? And then when you hear the, the boom, you know, on base, it's like, oh shit, you know, that, that, that hit us. So our, our battalion commander, uh, it was a lieutenant, lieutenant colonel. Um, he decided, hey, let's go ahead and, you know, get on one of our most dangerous routes, get all these vehicles here and stop them all, right? We're gonna stop this whole parking lot and make, make, make a parking lot on this freeway. And we're gonna walk around and we're gonna look for, for V beds. We're gonna check all these vehicles. And we heard about it, we we're like, you're kidding. Like, this, this has to be a joke. Like, you, you wanna literally stop all these cars and you want us to walk around to inspect vehicles, knowing that they're already using their, their, uh, you know, their phones or whatnot, right? And they're, they're using these things to detonate, you know? So we're literally gonna walk up as they're just waiting for us to come up. I'm like, just give them the opportunity, right? So we already kind of, um, kind of on, a, on, on the edge already, right? We're already thinking about like, damn, like this is probably a stupid mission, something's gonna happen, right? So I'm, I'm not the one walking around, but I'm on my platoon sergeant's uh, uh, Humvee, right? I'm the gunner. And um, we had a bunch of other vehicles that are parked throughout the, the streets, stopping, stopping the vehicles from coming in, right? Um, one of those streets, uh, one of our medics, uh, Ben, ben uh, Yehuda, um, especially Ben Yehuda, uh, he was outside the vehicle actually passing out teddy bears to kids. 
dude had like a solid heart. This dude, like he's literally there to capture minds and bodies type thing, right? He was he was that guy that when they say we're out there to capture the hearts of the people. Hearts and minds. Yeah, he he was that dude, literally. Um, not giving a shit again. He's a medic, so he's out there just you know passing out you know all these uh, all these stuffed animals. These kids, right? So obviously you know kids see it, they come running up, right? They said there was like over 20 some kids that, that were there that came running up, a couple of parents and stuff. Um, we heard a bunch of shots coming off, right? A bunch of a uh, bunch of rounds. I wasn't right there at, at that moment, but uh, we heard a bunch of uh, rounds going off, right? We heard the gunner shooting, and then we just heard a big boom. So we heard it. We we turned. We saw it. Big old cloud of smoke was popped up, right? We're like, shit. So uh, my opportunity sergeant is yelling at our driver, "Get there! Get there! Get there!" We go pulling up. And like, you know, one of our Humvees is literally just blown up all in the front. And there's just like bodies everywhere. And we didn't know, you know, whose bodies or what it was, right? But then, you know, after we were there and we're waiting for them to like to, to pull our dudes, like we just see, you know, there's kids everywhere. There's like literally, I think it, it, it they went on the, on the news or whatever it was. It was like 20 kids died, like three, I think three, three of their uh, like, you know, um, adults had passed um a couple of people were, were injured and then they they killed uh yehuda and then injured like two of our other guys and it was just it was crazy i mean I, it's, it's something that obviously that you you can't erase you know in your memory it's one thing where you you see these uh these bodies you know is one thing but seeing kids is, is a whole different level and then watching them you know carry your buddy you know and putting them in a putting putting them in the in the in the, in the 113 you know the, the medic shit they have there and they're 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 trying to rush them over you know where we're flying, you know, in front of them, trying to trying to clear away, you know, to, to get them over there. But we already knew, you know, it was it's just it was what it was, you know. Wow. Right? My my whole thing now is always, you know, it is what it is, you know. You it happened, you know. But that's one thing that you know, it's it's just a uh, you never you never knew who and, and when, right? It was one of those things, and I think that's where we we were out there when we kind of were living on, on the edge of is uh, you never knew when it was your turn to not to not not like to say to die, but it was you never knew when it was your turn to, to be in that in that position. Yeah. Right. Returning fire, um, you know, getting getting hit by an, uh, a V bed, you know, an IED, you know, and it, it all comes down to like the angle, you know, literally, was it angled to you correctly? You know, did they, did, did they did they time it correctly when they when they hit it? You know, you don't really see many many um, I guess uh, vehicles going out at night, right? You know, when it hits like. But it gets pretty dark, get late, you know, we, we kind of all pull in for the night. The majority of us. Um, during that time is when they're out there, dude. They're, they're out there, you know, digging holes in the, in the you, know, you know, in the concrete, patching them up. I mean, they're doing the work. They're putting, you know, mortars, you know, bombs all, all over the floor as you're driving by. You know, because they knew, you know, there's a thing where, you know, you got to constantly change it up, right? You, you got to change up what you do. But they knew. Do you have bombs on the outsides? Cool. You're going to drive in the middle? Let's put bombs in the middle, you know, like they, they knew what they were doing. Obviously, they're people think, you know, oh, third world country and whatnot, but they got brains. They, they've been in combat for how many years, you know, they're, they're, they're inspecting, seeing when they were going out. You know, all of our vehicles are marked, you know, um, we all have numbers on the side of our vehicles. They see that as well. They know what it is. It's just a thing where it's like, you know, we, we didn't change things up. So V beds and people were dying all the time, you know. Um, to a point where we had to like go and, and upgrade all of our vehicles to even more stuff, right? We had a, uh, they're blowing up tanks, you know, from the bottom, like ripping through them. They just, they, um, during that time they came out with, um, man, what was it called? They're, they're IEDs, but they're like, basically, um, they would put a plate behind them. Right. So then pressure would, plate, the pressure plate, and then you put screws and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. So literally when it, when it, when it would hit your vehicle, these things would, would fly through like, like knives through butter. Like they would just come ripping through, you know, and they're getting through all of our, you know, our gov government armor, right. That we have, you know, and people were, yeah, they were, they were dying left and right. We, we lost a good amount of people, you know, with, with that, with snipers, with, with, um, Yehuda was probably the, the closest to me, you know, they're talking about the, the ones out there. Only because, I mean, he lived a couple doors down from me. He was, you know, he was one of our medics. We used to go partying together, you know, in Savannah and go, go hang out and, and, you know, in his room drink. He was, I was actually, again, I, was, I turned 20 um, before deployment. So I turned 21 when I was, when I was coming back. I'm sorry, when I was, when I was there for our deployment. Um, so he was like that dude that, you know, kind of like the big brother guy, you know. Hey, can I have a beer, you know, whatnot, and that, you know, that, that kind of dude. So... He was the, the closest, but I think I think the one that hit us the the hardest 
um, with was a PFC Ken Ziegler. Um, you know, when when he passed, that was like a that was a that was a hit. It was a hit. What happened? Um, uh, and my and I'll be honest, my memory is like I I don't know if I blocked stuff or what it was, but I got a very very selective memory on on, on what I remember. But I, what I do remember is. One of our guys of another platoon, uh, he was getting ready to to, to leave in, in, in Ziggler's place because um, he was about to have a baby. So um, Ziggler said, "Hey, you go ahead and go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll switch with you. You know, you're gonna have a baby. Like go." So during that time when he left is when when it all, you know, it happened. Um, and and tell me, I kind of recall. I think it was. It, I, I think it was from IED, because I remember one of our guys took it pretty hard. Um, one of our guys, Wilson, another buddy of mine, um, I remember him talking to me, and he literally was telling me he had his fingers on his throat, holding veins together, you know, to stop the bleeding to see if he can make it through. And then, you know, obviously when you get there, you got to let go to, you know, to get him out and stuff. And then he just ended up, you know, bleeding out and dying. But um, I think that one hit the hardest. Mm -hmm. um, that was our first one. So I think that when we uh, when we did our our first taps, right when you're when you're in there and you're you're doing a memorial and they they call out the names right there like you know Sergeant so and so you know you know here for a sergeant so and so here for a sergeant and you do the whole PFC Kenneth Ziegler, P, you know PFC Kenneth Ziegler and they're like going through the the steps and motions. Um, that's when it hits. That's when you're like, fuck, we lost somebody. Like it's it's you know then you you. Flinch when that when that, when the, when, the, when the taps goes off right you hear the twenty one gun salute you and you start hearing those things go off, and I don't care who you are I don't care how buff strong whatever mentally prepared you are, the first time you hear that taps, you're all gonna cry like babies. It is what it is. Like you you it hits you, like there's there's no other there's a, no other way to say it. Like there's just things that that happen out there that you that you become numb to, but that first one. I don't think anything hits like that. That that first one, it's it definitely hits you the hardest. I remember um, uh, that one other time we're we're out there and we're actually we're actually just doing like just checking around, and going around, just security, right? Just showing presence again. And I remember um, hearing like a like a bomb go off. And again, these people are smart. They they know what they're doing, right? They literally just drew us in. And so we we come up and we're we're we go up to the area where, where, where the the bombs went off, right? Um, and it's just like we were getting attacked from the top, like they were literally just waiting for us. And we pulled up and we were, we're jumping out and we're, you know, doing our little searches and whatnot, walking around the area and then boom, we just hear shots coming off, just like, just from up, up above. We're trying to like locate, you know, where it's at. And I think that was a, another feeling, right? Where, you know, you're getting shot at, don't know where it's coming from and you're trying to figure it out. Your heart's pounding cause you're trying to figure it out, but your adrenaline's hitting too. Like you don't. You don't know what, what kind of feeling to have at that time. You're just like you're just, you're everywhere, you know. And we're all like people are yelling at each other. I remember my my uh, my uh, lieutenant was kind of like you know he was newer, you know. He came out of out of out of, uh, out of college, and uh, obviously our platoon sergeant's a lot more seasoned. So I remember um, I remember hearing my platoon sergeant like just going off on him, like like saying, "Sir, you know, calm the fuck down and get it together," you know. Like just he's like. Roger, let's get, you know, then he starts giving orders, you know, like calmly, you know, but initially he was like, I can over here, I don't fucking over here, like he was, just, he was just flipping out, you know, and it was funny because, uh, again, uh, my platoon sergeant, uh, Sergeant Casper, it's a badass dude, I ain't gonna lie, like, you know, maybe you ever meet him, you know, you ever hear about him, like, he's, he was that dude, he was just like very calm, collective, like you, you could not, like, get him at a point where he was, like, not in control, like his composure was always there, we would, uh, go to chow together, go to the gym together. Uh, we watch movies together, you know. And I always laugh because I'm like, you probably do some of the, the gayest shit in the military, you know. Never will I be out here snuggling up with some dude, you know. And not snuggling, but I mean like laying in the same bed. Laying in the same bed, covered in the same cover, watching the movie on a laptop. Some, and share, sharing, sharing earbuds together, right? Like here's yours, here's mine, and we're, and we're watching movies, you know. Some of the gayest shit. If you do it here, oh, for sure, hundred percent. Like you're, you're, you're gonna look that over there. Like you know, 
it's, it's funny because people walk in and not even question it, you know, in the military. They walk in, they're like, hey, what are you guys watching? You know, here they'd be like, why are you guys laying in the same bed together? <laughs> like, what's going on here, you know? And then one day um, we found out that there was like volleyball courts behind us. So we went and bought a, we, we had bought a, a volleyball thing and like every day we're out there. Like we were just like competitive as hell, just like smack each other in the face type shit. Like it was, it was crazy. We actually arranged, um, they ended up arranging like a tournament and me and uh, my team, like we took it all. Like we, we, were, we smoked them, we we're bad. It was, uh, it was fun. It was like, you know, one of our things that we, again, when um, you try to, you, you try to uh, escape kind of what's there, you know, the feelings and stuff, you know, and you try to make it as normal as possible. So you have the internet, right? You, you know, you, you do things on the internet to, to keep in touch. And in all reality, I think, I think keeping in touch with your family is like probably even harder than, than it is if you didn't, you know? It's kind of like, you know, to say like when you're in jail, you know, don't visit me type shit, you know? Um, it just, it's different. Like you, you, you get those feelings from home again. It's just, it just doesn't work well out there. What was it like returning from that combat deployment? Oh man, um, change for sure. You know, um, it's funny because when, when I went over there, I, like I said, I, I, I didn't, I didn't um, expect to be different in any kind of way. But you can't, you can't unsee things, right? And I think that kind of that kind of like burns into you a little bit, where where you're you're a different person. Um, you appreciate shit a lot more for sure. You know, people take so much crap for granted with their stupid little arguments. They want to, you know, you know, more rights and whatever they, you know, whatever they want to argue about. You know, that they have time to do that. I mean, that's cool. That's your that's your own thing, but um they don't appreciate shit like that like it's just like you, you come back and like just walking around you know not not having to worry about you know shit going off you know that feeling and obviously you take some time because you, you you get back and you're you're driving a certain speed limit that you used to drive you know when you're overseas you're driving a certain way cautiously right you're you're um you're on high high alert still you're still looking around you know your back and shoulder you're not you're not sitting anywhere where where someone is not in front of you and you know never behind you type of stuff right and it, it takes a while um, you know, being around family, at, you know, it's just, it's different. You, you feel like no one gets you at the time, right? Um, I think that's, that's a big part of like that reintegration process is like, we don't, we don't give, give our people enough time and enough, uh, training to, to be ready to come back. I think that little week time frame that we do like, Hey, it's going to happen. And you know, this is how you're going to feel, you know, I think it's, I think it's a bunch of bullshit. Uh, my first point was more again, clearing buildings and, and, and doing that kind of thing. Uh, I got the chance to be on my second deployment, part of uh, my command sergeant major's uh, PSD team, right? The private security detail. So dealing with uh, high officials and whatnot, driving around, doing stuff, you know, um, kind of like doing politic work, right? But just the bodyguards of that politician type of stuff. So uh, command, command sergeant major Brahane was, uh, was my command sergeant major at the time. Um, he worked alongside of uh, Colonel Farrell. I think Colonel Farrell's now like a, like a two or three star general or something like that. He's, if you look him up, he's a, he's a bad dude. But um, that point was different. It was a lot different. It was um, the ROEs changed, you know, the rules of engagement. Where'd you go? Uh, same place. I was still in Baghdad, uh, Mosul, province. Uh, um, I think it was Mosul. Um, it was just different, though, because, you know, before it was like they have a weapon, you know, you, use your best judgment type of thing. This time, you know, this is 2000, 2007 now, right? So I was deployed the first time in 2005. Now we're in 2007. And we're already told, you know, we're doing an 18 month deployment and now we're being told, you know, during that deployment, hey, by the way, um, unless they're pointing the gun at you and they're about to pull that trigger, you know, you can't really do anything. Everything changed. It was, it was, it came to a, where you were like feeling like you, you, uh, you felt like you had no control over there anymore. You know, the first deployment, I felt like I had a lot, a lot more control because we were willing to, to do things, you know, as an infantry unit and then being with, with that team there, it was just different. So like I said, the, the first deployment, you know, talking about the whole bombs coming in, right? It wasn't, you know, never came near. Um, but definitely, you know, on, on the, uh, they had our number. They had our number on, on, on this deployment. They, we were literally sitting below the road, right? So when people would drive by, we could see cars driving by. Like we would have guys like driving by and like just stop and guy would pop on the, in the back of their, their, their truck and just, you know, shoot, a, shoot an RPG off real quick or fire off an AK real quick and just take off. And I'm just like, why are we here? Like, well, <laughs> this is probably the worst. It was um, Fob, Fob Kalzu. It was probably the worst spot to be in. It, it didn't make sense to me. Like, I was like, this is so stupid. So I remember the, the first time hearing about it, you know, someone, uh, a bomb hit, and one of our, one of their soldiers that was there, uh, a female, 
she was asleep. Hit her, hit her room and killed her in her sleep. You know, literally just died in her sleep from, from a bomb, right? That was, that's when it hit. I'm like, damn, like these dudes, you know, they have, they, they have our number. Like they, somebody's here, someone here is one of these workers or whatever is doing the pacing for them and they're, they're, they're counting out, you know, what's what and they're giving them the intel for sure. Um, this one morning though, we're getting ready to roll out. It was early in the morning and we, I never eat breakfast. Like I'm, I'm just wasn't a breakfast person in general, right? So, um, I actually, you know, we all, we're all there together. You know, all of our Humvees were all parked. Our command sergeant manager said, hey, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go get chow real quick, you know, come out. He got his chow, came out. A Couple of guys went in, came out. We're all sitting right there by the Humvee eating. Um, and I remember we're like joking with each other and just like laughing and we hear like a big boom. I looked at my buddy, I'm like, man, a IED? He's like, D-bed? And then we hear boom, 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 right? And we're like, daisy chain? And then all of a sudden, right when I said that, we hear, you hear the whistle, right? Just flying by you. And the child hall that we were just in, fucking boom, fucking hit that shit. And we're like, I don't even know. We're, we're pretty close. Like we're, we're pretty, pretty close distance from this thing, right? So like literally that shit hits and we just, it's fucking loud. It's like the next one hits, boom. And we're just like, holy shit. So we heard the first one. We're like crawling inside the Humvees. We're underneath the Humvees. Trying to find any kind of protection we could find, right? So... Um, after it's done, we notice that nothing's all going off. I'm like, I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. So we're grabbing our, our, our weapons and we're running straight into, in, into the, you know, the fire in there. And we're like pulling out dudes. We're like, you know, going in there. One of our guys like had like burns on his hands from like where we had, had gone into, but we're, you know, could barely breathing there. We're trying to put our baklavas on, you know, trying to, trying to, you know, put some water on so we don't breathe in all the smoke, you know, checking on people, pulling them out and stuff. It was, it was crazy. Um, but I remember is that our comms get, you know, whenever shit like that happens, someone dies, your comms get shut off. And at the time, I was married at the time. I had uh, my son, Christopher, who was probably about a year at that time, somewhere around there. Um, and I remember my platoon sergeant, my old platoon sergeant, he had messaged me and was like, you know, and this is something that she had access to. So he wrote me, he said, hey, I heard you got hit and I know you're not a breakfast person. I heard your child hall got hit, but I know you're not a breakfast person. Hope all, hope, hope all is okay, right? So my wife at the time looks at it and she was like, what the fuck? You know, obviously we have a little baby and whatnot. I'm sure, all, I'm sure she ran through all the emotions, right? Um, so a couple of days went by where like we didn't speak, right? Because the comms were all shut down and whatnot. Because, you know, we got to contact the next of kin and all that kind of fun stuff. So I remember her telling me that like the, the day prior to me calling, um, her brother was living there at the time and, and he, and he ordered pizza, right? So she's already kind of looked into like what happens, you know? So I guess they rang the doorbell and she fucking said she broke down, was, you know, going through all the emotions or whatever. And then her brother was like, you know, what happened? What happened? What happened? And she, and he's like, he's like, what? She's like, the doorbell, like someone's here. And he's like, I ordered pizza. And she was like, why the fuck would you order pizza right now? Like, what are you doing? And like, you know, he was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, whatever. So like, yeah, the, the, I think, I don't know if it was the next day or like hours later, whatever it was, but I call, you know, Hey, you know, how's everybody, whatever. It's like, Oh my God, you know, I saw, you know, the message from, 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 uh, Sergeant Casper. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like my bad, you know, uh, I didn't realize that you could see that and whatever, but yeah, like I remember that, I remember that specifically because, you know, how close it was, what happened. And then like the emotions from the family that happens, right. It kind of gave me a whole ball of all of it, you know, like these are the emotions that go through, like, you know, you know we're deployed for sure, but the emotion that everyone else is at home, you know, my mom was freaking out. My dad was freaking out. Everyone, everyone was so worried because obviously that, that news of what happened to us was spread, you know? So yeah, that's, that's the one thing I think I remember the most. I mean, besides obviously my first deployment, but from that deployment, that thing hit and it was just like, it was something different. I'm very big on mental health, right? I mean, I went through my share of, of, of fun times trying to get right in my head, trying to, trying to feel uh, you know, better about myself in general. And during our deployment, there was like a little, little bit of a fraternization type thing going on, right? Um, between, you know, uh, one of our, our male NCOs and, and a younger, younger individual was a, a military cop. Uh, her name, um, well, Jackie. Um, they got in kind of a, a pretty, pretty tight niche relationship. Like they were, they were pretty close. And when everyone found out about it, they kind of called it splits. They had to call it splits, right? They're, they're, they're forced to stay away from each other. So during that time, um, Jackie was going through like so much stuff already. She was going through stuff from home, whatever. She was just kind of just, just combination of things, right? 
So she was on the whole suicide watch team, right? They took all of her stuff from her, right? How to be escorted everywhere she went, all that kind of stuff. So I remember um, she lived, we were in like these, uh, these two man um, cubes, right? We were living in. So she was like, I don't know, maybe like five across and like one over, right? Where she, where she lived at with her, with her roommate. And I remember one night we just heard a fucking, just a loud pop. And we're like, what the fuck? So we all go running outside. Cause obviously, you know, you don't, you don't hear gunshots in our area, right? You, you, even when you clear your weapon out, out when you're coming in, you know, you fucked up if you're, if you're, if a round's coming out, right? You didn't clear it right. So we heard it and we're like, what the fuck? So we all run outside and we hear people screaming and whatnot. And I guess her, her roommate had left to uh, take a shower, but left her, left her, uh, her, her, you know, her weapon right there. And Mary Jane just took it and took her life, you know, with it. Oh. So, um, it just, I think, I think a lot of people, um, a lot of people think about the dangers of being there, you know, physical, physical form, but a lot of people don't, don't realize the, the mental aspect it has on you as well. You know, that, that mental part weighs a heavy part on I think, all of us for deployments, you know, whether you're, whether you're in combat or you're not in combat, I think just being over there in general, Kind of sits it, it, it sits in, the, in a spot in you where um, you're very uncomfortable and your 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 mental part is just it's just it's vulnerable as hell, right? I came back in I think July of 2008, and then I was out in November. I was back for for a couple of months before I left. Um, I think just the thought alone of like going going home and getting out of the military was was enough to like to kind of get me in a get me in a mood. Like I was like. Um, I wasn't ready yet, you know, uh, my wife at the time, she, she was, she, when I came home, she got pregnant with, with our, you know, our daughter. So literally I was at home for whatever time she got pregnant and nine months later I get back and I have another kid. Right. So initially it was just like a lot, a lot going on. Right. Um, I got back in like literally a month later she was born. It was just, you know, it was one of those things where it's a lot like, to deal with. Yeah. A newborn baby, a, a toddler just coming back in all reality, you know, me and me and uh, their mom, we weren't even living together, you know, because it was, you know, just a situation of deploying all this stuff. Right. I mean, we lived in it for a very, 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 very short time, uh, but she was in California the majority of the time. Um, so it was different. Like it was just a word, word to be, you know to be a father where to you know be a husband be a provider and be a protector and all that kind of stuff you know when i'm already going through my own mental shit as you're happy right my turn my transition sucked <laughs> to be honest i i you know when they when they tell you that they're going to prepare you to to leave the military they're not doing that man they're they're just like they're kind of just pushing you out you want to get out get out you know go ahead and then you got to find your way um so my transition you know besides leaving my buddies i mean obviously that's the worst part leaving people that, that you serve with for so long, you know, that, that you literally can, you can see them as your, 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 your blood, right? Like, like those, those are my dudes. I still talk to them now. Um, it's a lot, man. But coming out of, coming out of, a, a, of the military transitioning, stressful, you know, anxiety, stressful, depression. I mean, dealing with your PTSD when you get out from the you know, appointments or not. I don't know how many times I sat there and just like, and, and drank to, to myself to go to sleep. And literally waking up to 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 um, like getting jolted because I hear trash cans being banged or whatever, you know, and I'm just like flipping the hell out, like like what like what was that? Or you know, loud noises being you know going out by me. Like it was transition for for somebody is is probably hard as it is already, but when you're transitioning as like a someone that was been in combat that that's that's been through it, you know, that's um, that's seen people you know go to their thing you know, through, through the bombs and whatever, whatever it may be, you know, um, it's a lot. So when you're trying to, when you're trying to transition, you know, out of, out of that into, into civilian life, it's hard. You know, it took me, it took me like two years to like, to, to feel like I was somewhat normal where I was at, you know, up until probably pretty recent, I didn't even talk about any of this stuff, um, at all. Like I, I was, I was very, very closed off to all of it. Um, I have not been back to like Georgia, like, you know, where I was at my, my unit to, you know, to say my piece. It'd be 15 years. Kind of, this, this Veterans Day would be my 15 year mark that I was out, um, which I keep telling myself, you know, I got to go back just to kind of kind of close the chapter, you know, go over there and say my piece and say, say my goodbyes. Um, but I really didn't do anything to talk about anything until until recent. Um, I joined the American Legion, you know, over in Chino, uh, talked to my people about it, you know, and it's just a thing where 
I was very closed off. And I think I think it, it, it kind of hindered a lot of like relationships that I had in my life with family, with people in general. Um, I became very closed off. I was a uh, very very worried about what what they would think of me you know if i kind of spilled the beans on you know what it was like and stuff like that and you know what we got what we went through and how it was um yeah i think that was probably the worst of it i think is like you know worrying about what they, what they thought i think we're we're like you know especially with other veterans right where initially you think that you're you're alone and you're like the only one and you're going through that whole thing where no one's gonna understand me i'm i'm, a, I'm just only me what was me type shit right and then all of a sudden you talk to other people and it's like, dude, give, give me the, the same, before you even tell them what's going on with you, you hear everyone else talking about the same rundown. All go through the same shit. Had the same feelings, depression, anxiety, you know, um, you, using using stuff to, to, to self-medicate, right, with alcohol and whatnot. Um, it's just crazy that that uh, you think you're so alone until you actually go out there and you, you put yourself out there, you know? And I think that's that's a big part of like, again, like what, what everyone's trying to do now is just to, just to be a lot more open, right? Mm. So now, um, myself, uh, along with my, my partner, uh, Carlos, uh, Carlos Martinez, he's, he's a Navy vet. Um, we are starting a veterans nonprofit, right? So what that is, is we are doing an up-to-date transitioning program. Um, and when I say up-to-date, I literally mean up-to-date, meaning that what, what people did for, for, for new company veterans 20 years ago doesn't work today. You know, it, it, it's out of date. Um, we have a lot of organizations that have been here for decades and decades and they, had, they, don't, they don't want to change what they're doing. They don't want to change script. They want to just stay on the same path. But um, we understand that, you know, that, 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 yeah, we can get you jobs. We can do your resumes. We can get you all that stuff, right? But we, we've actually collaborated with another group of in, individuals. They're, they're actually uh, Tanya Estrada. She's, she's creating her own. It's called Yachts for Veterans. And what she does is she does the social entertainment part, right? So, again... We can do all we want for veterans, give them jobs and do all that stuff, right? But you still have the anxiety, you still have the depression, you still have the, the feeling of uh, not, not belonging. So what we do is we collaborate together. I'm going to get you a job. I'm going to get you all this stuff that you need so you're financially stable and you're not stressed out about that part. But we're also going to bring you in over here and you're going to join our events. You're going to come with us and go on yacht cruises, you know, to talk about stuff with other veterans or just sit back and just enjoy your time. Um, go to other social events that we have that like... Uh, um, uh, Lucha Vavum, another another thing that, that we go out and do, right? It's like a just a comedy, fun thing to do. But the whole thing is to get veterans out there and do social interactions, right? We want veterans to be able to connect with other veterans to know that they're not alone. Because it took me a long time to to understand that part. But um, we believe that you know between our process and what we're doing and collaborating with 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 our with our partner Tanya, um, it's going to bring a lot of veterans a lot closer and, and get them get them to where they need to be a lot quicker, right? We don't want them to be struggling for this long period of time to try to figure it out and you know. Um, that leads to a lot of other things. Uh, I don't want to backpedal, but a friend of mine uh, from from uh, you know the military, uh, he committed uh, suicide from from a, a cop. You know, this is God. This is like eight years ago, but his his mental state was so heavy that he literally went around robbing all these casinos until cops came up and caught up with him, and then he. Uh, jumped out with the unloaded weapon and they fired on him and killed him, you know, all because he, it was just too much. And what trips me out is the same day that this stuff happened, he was calling me, but we were on different times. You know, I was, I was actually sleeping, getting ready for, you know, or getting ready to go to work. So I saw, I saw his message when I was going to work. So I'm calling him and calling him and calling him and calling him. I'm like, man, like, like, what? I'm leaving message like, hey fam, you know, what was it? You know, what happened? Give me a call back. And then I get a call later on, like, hey, like, you know, fam's dead. I'm like, what? Like crazy. I just, you know, hearing about it and it's, I was like, he was just calling me, you know? So I'm, I'm very, very big on like this whole, this mental, mental state for veterans, right? Um, collaborating with people, uh, just, just making sure that we, you know, we, we police our own. Nobody else understands them like we do, right? You're, if you're a veteran, you understand a veteran. Whether you've been deployed or not deployed, you understand like what it's like to be an individual in, in the service. You know what it's like to be told what to do, when to do it, when to eat, when to sleep and so on, right? You're, you're a robot. So we try to get you out of that part. We try to get you back into a state where you're more self-efficient, right? We're going to guide you. We're going to mentor you. We're going to make you more self-efficient. We're going to make it so you can get back on your feet again and put your head up again and, and walk around and, and, and be proud of the service that you did and feel like you fit back in the community again, which I think is huge for all these veterans. We are called Camo to Civvies, right? Like camouflage to civilian clothing. Um, we're on IG uh, as Camo to Civvies. Um, 
we are starting a web page as well. Uh, my buddy Carlos is working on it now. But to get involved, just reach, reach out to us on, on Camera Civis. Uh, you can also reach out to Yachts for Veterans. Uh, either way, you can get a hold of us because, again, we work together for everything. Every collaboration we do uh, is between us. Um, but yeah, I mean, it'd be great to see you know, more vets come out and just, you know, again, spread, spread the awareness. You know, that's all we try to do is spread awareness to, to the, uh, the common, I guess, um, conflicts with veterans. And we just want to make sure that everyone understands them. And uh, again, civilian or veteran, I think we all need kind of to understand, you know, where, what kind of mindset that, that these veterans go through. Well, Chris, we're going to wrap it up. Um, any last words before we cut the tape? No, just to, you know, appreciate, appreciate this time for sure. You know, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling to kind of be able to talk about things and be, be open about the stuff. So, you know, I just hope that more vets do the same thing, you know, be able to talk about what they've been through, talk about their, their, the good and bad times, right? And then just, you know, just be expressive. Just, you know, whatever you need to say, just let it. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you sitting down with me. Appreciate it. Thank you. I got bad thoughts that make my mind scared Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears? Who gon' save me if you not right here? Move this darkness and make my sight clear Take me your way cause I don't like here Ghost of my past, they feelin' the night air Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares